Hi, I'm um, Elizabeth Coffin. I live right across the street, and um, I've been happily associated with the Basket Museum as the gardener in residence. But um, in the early, um, about 2003, I think, maybe 15 years ago, Oh, I've got a, there's a cell phone going off. Well, I forgot to mention that everyone can silence their cell phone. Okay, but I was just worried if it was mine, because I didn't <laughs> silence mine. I think it's in the room. Yes, it is. That's why I left it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, I found, I, I, what was happening was that I was going to the landfill and I was seeing the discarded chairs. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a preservationist. Um, by inclination and by training. My father was an art historian, uh, my mother was a rare book a person, and so we've always um, ha um, valued, oh, my father, my grandfather was an architect who worked a lot in, in Nantucket with Mr. Beinecke rebuilding the old um, structures. And uh, in fact, I had the um, 106 Main Street facade um, sitting in my yard for six years before I found somebody, or Sheila Fee from Flock, found it and took it and rebuilt it and used it. Um, I really don't like to th see things that have uh, value, that have had uh, human handwork um, put into them. And I hate to see them thrown away if they can be made, um, if you can make them functional again. This one happened to be a particularly good one. Oh, and anyway, in the beginning of the uh, 2003, I um, was seeing more and more of these broken chairs left uh, to be thrown out. And I, I realized that I didn't know of anybody who was, who was um, doing it. And so I uh, talked to a man named Peter Wilson, who was older. He was retired. And I asked him to teach me. And he did. I took a, I created a de facto apprenticeship with him. Very, very kind. The, um, you need a certain, I must say, you need a certain temperament to be a, a cane worker. Um, you have to have lots of patience and lots of perseverance. Um, why it looks like, you know, they used to make the joke about, you know, basket making. It, it's being, you know, for um, not bright people, but in fact, in fact, chair caning, which looks very, um, it can look very matter of fact, um, has lots and lots of um, judgments that you have to make. And your focus, the people who like doing it are people who like uh, deep focus work because they, you really have to push everything else out of your head in order to uh, follow what you're doing. Um, because you take your t attention off of it, and then you don't know where you are. You, get, you, you just get lost in this maze of, of uh, canary. Um, now, they, This one was a particularly nice example of work, and the best. Um, and it has a um, binding around it, which I had never seen anywhere, and I've never seen it in any books. There are books for chair caning, which um, I, you know, you can find easily enough. There's a wonderful supply house uh, that I use, which is H.H. H. Perkins in uh, North Haven, Connecticut, and they have been selling cane uh, since 1918, um, and there's and still at it, you know, generations uh, later, but. Um, I had uh, never seen this, and I'm going to take it apart and try to teach myself how to recreate it, because um, it was done by somebody who was uh, really uh, smart and talented and experienced. Um, and the way you can tell a good uh, uh, previous hand worker is that there's very little on the bottom. It's very tight, very clean. The cleaner it is, the more experienced and the better the hand worker. Would there be little pieces? 
Yeah, well, because you're cutting strings and poking them in holes and weaving them together. And every, um, you can have long, long, long strings, um, although they tend to break down towards the end of their use because like anything, they've been get put through so much friction that they're going to um, fatigue. Um, but uh, this is how you tell a really um, professional, uh, good, good, good job. Um, yes, because otherwise there are hundreds and hundreds of little um, No, nope, that, that just one we'll see. Well, you can see. See all those cut ins? And everywhere that you have a peg, it's probably holding um, a cut in down in place. Um, so, there, um, the thing about the, the um, uh, just a little background on uh, chairs and caning. The, um, it's about in the 18th century that um, the supply of cane began to get predictable and they started using it to create uh, this uh, new, it was uh, furniture which was extremely lightweight. That's, its, that's one of its uh, main values because you can take these chairs and put them around anywhere. They travel beautifully if you need to um, uh, carry them around. They're, um, qu they're quite, um, they're just, I think they're just wonderful. The, um, and this design, which is the hexagonals that are, um, uh, that are all put together is a way of um, distributing the weight of the body, right? Because it's going in all these different directions and um, that holds the body weight very, very well. And it is, so it's lightweight because you've got, you don't have a solid plank um, and it is, um, it, it just, it's very effective um, seating. Comfortable, too. Um, so instead of taking, so in, you know, in the 17th century, you'd have a plank seat and you would have to put, end up putting a cushion on it. You'd have to end up trying to make it more comfortable. Um, in the uh, colonies, uh, they, the first that they used before they got the ready supply of rattan uh, cane was um, rush, cattails. Um, and the rush work um, is comfortable too. Uh, and it lasts about as long as the, um, and really old chairs, you will, in museums, you will see that the uh, um, old examples of rush work. Um, it's, that's even harder to find, the person to do that work than the caning. Um, the, now the thing was that it was done in England um, by the um, Basket Guild in the 17th century. The basket guild would used, um, work, they worked with willow before they um, got cane. And working with, they needed a guild and a medieval group of, uh, you know, organization of artisans because um, baskets were used in the marketplace uh, to sell products by volume rather than weight. You weren't, you know, you, there weren't scales everywhere, um, except for, you know, uh, precious metals. Um, but uh, so volume meant that the the guild had to regulate um, uh, the making of the baskets, and they are the ones who tra who sort of lent themselves to taking on the um, seat making and cane caning. Now the um, when it came across the United States, it was, um, it's the most of the examples of chairs that we see are from here in Nantucket um, are from the early 19th, maybe 1830 up until, um, up until now. But, the, you know, we, we're so conservative here because we just, these things come out of the attic. Um, and they're, 
they have a long history. People hold on to these chairs until they can't figure out what to do with them any longer. And that's mm -hmm. why, I mean, nobody really wants to throw them out, but they're such a space and storage problem that um, th this, this skill needs to be um, redeveloped here because we've got the old product, these old products. They were um, really quite democratic in the sense that um, people could afford them. These were um, middle class people could afford them. You could have them in your house. This is, you know, stencil, gold stencil work. It's a fancy chair is what it was called. Sometimes you find them painted. Um, this happens to be just uh, stencil work. Um, but they have, um, they have uh, trem tremendous amount of work put into them. There were factories of chair making, but each one of these factories could produce these pieces, the turnings, and put them together, but it, they still had to have it hand woven seat. Um, so cottage, uh, especially in Gardner, Massachusetts, is known for, as a center for, there was a whole entire cottage industry of um, homemakers and, uh, you know, elderly people or anybody who could t turn their hand to it would be taking the product from the factory owner um, and weaving it and turning back and getting, you know, a certain small sum of money. But um, Massachusetts has long been known at, for the center of this um, chair-making production. And um, by 1865, with the Industrial Revolution coming, quickening, um, they devised a machine to make pressed cane together. Um, That's a, a, this is not an example of the machine, but this is an example of what you get when you buy your piece of pre-woven uh, material. And there, around the corners here, there's a channel that's dug, and, and uh, then a spline, which is a piece of uh, soft rattan. Um, from the inside of the rattan, and it holds down the prefabricated material. Um, we, uh, I don't think it's as good as the um, handwork, structurally. Because one of the other things that when you do this is you're pulling together all of the elements of the chair. Um, so you have a you have a chair that responds organically. You know, it's it it can move and squirm and and go with people's bodies, um, but it also um, hold is is held together so nicely. Now, usually when you find them, they've um, been squirmed in too much. Um, and you have to do a little bit of repair work. That, this, this board has separated. It's, it takes virtually nothing for me to take um, a big rubber mallet, um, some glue, and knock it into shape and re-glue it. You know, people, you have to re-glue your chairs every generation anyway. Um, for the most part, because um, unless they're all made of one piece of um, unbroken material, they uh, they disassociate from each other. Everything dries up. The cane lasts for about, um, if you're lucky, a, a generation, depending upon the amount of use and abuse it's been given. Um, the the uh, Pre, the pressed cane, pressed cane came into being because they could produce more faster. They, so you have huge quantities of these old chairs uh, left um, all over the country. Uh, we're, we've lost most of them, but some of them are going to actually be preserved. Um, and in order to do that, I wanted to get a, a group of, a te start teaching more people. Um, and I had a, a lovely group of uh, 
cane workers, people who already knew how to use cane because they had learned it in order to do their baskets. Um, because cane as an organic material, um, this is it's just not a machine. It's a, it's a, it, you almost think of it as a living uh, piece because it can it can twist in your hands while you're working in it and um, it can it, it uh, breaks and it does it does all sorts of interesting things um, that you didn't expect so you have to ha um, the people that I were teaching in the from the Lightship Basket Museum um, did wonderful work they took to it they wanted it and they all had a chair in their basement that they knew that they knew that they needed to um, address, and they'd been hanging on to it for twenty years or so. So, um, and uh, Bernice, who's here, had a chair that was interesting in the sense that it had um, it had the holes, um, and it had previously been caned, um, but then somebody had come along and recaned it with a um, machine made. And they had dug, that where the holes were, they had dug the channel, you know, with a drill or a bit of some sort, and created this channel, put in the press, and so Bernice took out the old uh, press and re returned to the earlier um, yeah, pan caning, and did a lovely, successful job. And I think her chair that's hand caned now is going to last longer than the uh, pressed cane. Because the pressed cane is not really, at it's only attached to the chair by um, glue. Yeah. Glue dries out. Um, and, or it pop, things pop. Um, and Whereas the each one of these holes that is in here has had it has been strung and been wrapped and tied and or retied and and has been thoroughly um, uh, attached. So um, there's also another chair here. This is a very nice chair. Um, it was, and here, here you see the holes. Can you see? You see the holes, and um, but this chair had not originally started out life as a um, cane chair. It had started out as a um, rush or cord ch uh, chair. And the way you can tell that is because it this bar has been put on, and these are side pieces. Um, they come off, you then wrap it with the, the rush or paperwork, um, and uh, then put these back on. But somebody wanted to um, alter it and did. Because as I said, it's harder to find rush workers than it is to find cane workers. So they drilled the holes in it and created this, um, it's an evolved chair, okay? <laughs> um, but if you have really, really conservative um, uh, cultures and, and the Nantucket 19th and 20, early 20th century cultures, they don't want to let go of too much. Um, and until you hit pockets of affluence, you can't afford to let them go. So now, um, anyway, Bernice, Bernice reverted to her, the earlier form of the chair. I want to talk about um, the tools and the materials and the um, process. Uh, the process is not difficult, but it um, can be quite challenging in ways that you, uh, it's hard to comprehend sometimes. Um, there are seven stages of working the cane. The first stage, here, I'm gonna, now this is, you see this is an old chair. Um, it's got a broken uh, back right here, it's missing it. But it was lovely bird's eye maple, so somebody really wanted to keep it. 
no reason why you can't, as long as um, you're willing to um, do the work. So you have here the beginning of the, the process. Um, the first process takes um, um, this and you soak it in water. You have to soak it in water because otherwise it's going to crack and break. Um, so uh, when you're working, it's good to do it in the summertime or someplace where you can put a lot of, um, you know, you can make a mess. Um, but the f you, once you soak it, um, it develops um, a suppleness so that it can go in all different directions. It can tie itself onto itself. It can, um, it, it, it really can go a lot of places. And it has to, because um, you start out, you have it empty, you've, you've cleaned all the old out, old glue and old, and you've uh, glued the chair back in together and you start just at the middle and you put your first step in, anchor it, and then go to the back. And at the back, you go down, um, you anchor it, and then you come up, so you go sideways. You come up sideways into the, the a neighbor hole. Um, you prevent the cane from twisting and turning because you want to keep it all working in the same plane. Um, because while it will twist and can twist and does twist, in order for you to be most su um, successful in the sense that you put less pressure. When it's twisted, it, it won't take the pressure as well. When you keep it all in the same plane, um, you get, you get a, a clean bottom, clean top, and by clean, I mean it's just, it's uh, smooth. Um, so anyway, you come up the neighbor ring hole, you go over back down, um, come up, and so you go, the first stage will be when you've put all of them in vertical format. Um, second stage is you will go then horizontally. You start again here in the middle, go through, come up, down, up and down, and uh, making certain that two things, that this is uh, tight and, uh, not tight, but uh, flat and um, close to the chair itself, so that there's no draggy loops underneath. Um, but you can't do it too tight because you've got to be working the uh, stuff above. And um, it, when it's wet and supple, um, it will, uh, you can push it and pull it in all sorts of ways, but as soon, it will dry. And then when it dries, it contracts and everything um, gets taut and chair, you know, looks more like your normal chair seat. Um, and it dries. Uh, it, it conforms to the holes, it conforms to, you know, what you've asked of it. Um, but you've only say you've only done two of the, you've done a, this, hor you've done the verticals and you've done the horizontals, um, and that's enough for today. You have to bring it back the next day and get it wet. And this means that um, put a lot of cloth, wet cloth. People use spray bottles. They use, um, um, the thing about caning is that people invent a lot of uh, personal solutions for how they want to do it. Um, but there is no getting around the fact that you have to have it wet. Um, so you leave enough room so that um, you've done your first set of verticals and first set of horizontals on top of the verticals. And then your third set of going through is um, another uh, set of verticals. Now, so you've got the, you've got the, a layer. There's sandwiching of these strings, and 
The fourth set is when you start to weave because, and it's your, it is a horizontal um, that you weave and it is, here's an example of one being woven. And you can see that there's enough give here so that you can work in and out of the, um, you go, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over. It's fun because it's starting, you're starting to get some definition. You're starting to make um, those uh, little squares, which um, you then have to uh, continue to work with. Now, it will slide beautifully because the silicon nature of the outside of the material um, wants to, it likes to move. Um, but you have to, it's amazingly strong and an amazingly um, weak sometimes. It, um, the, you know, it can, it's, can split inside of itself. It can, anyway, the, the cane workers, you know, have a lot of experience with what uh, the cane can do. And the, the quality of the cane will also depend, be dependent on what kind of a product uh, you, you're able to achieve. The, um, so that fourth sequence is weaving. And you have something that looks like a recognizably, you know, here's the, there, these little boxes that you've created in, in the air. And you have to kind of keep on pressing them together so that you have couples here and then couples here. Because after this, the fifth step, you're going to start working on, on the oblique going from cross, uh, cross to cross. Um, here. No, can you? Uh, no, this is the wrong chair, sorry. This chair. There's the cross, there's the obliques. See? Okay. And um, so you go this way, this way. This is where it starts to get um, um, more fun or more challenging. Um, I'll tell you why, but I want to just go through the steps that you. I was just going to show. Oh, good. Ashley's my, my prize student. <laughs> <laughs> both, both yeah. with you met you both met oh, different challenges. Let's see, I've yeah. gone almost gone the one direction. Yeah, and okay. now I'm gonna have to go the other then way. You return this way, <laughs> and when you've press done that, you've created um, that pattern. Yeah, yeah. that awkward. Yeah, so that's a si that's six stages of. Six stages. And um, the seventh stage is the binding stage. Here, I'll just put this this way. Can you see? Um, here's the binding stage. I find the binding stage to be the most difficult because you're putting in um, extra pieces of cane into holes that have already got six or you know strands in them. So you're just you're you're you really um, end up using more tools and more agility. I'm I'm. Some, I'm, I go under the chair, I turn the chair, I turn it upside down, I turn it sideways, I do everything in order to try to get um, this last piece, which you don't need. In other words, strictly utilitarian purposes, you don't need it, but it looks 
so much nicer. So here's what it looks like when it's not bound. Now the problem for at this point that you then, as you do your um, obliques, you start to meet um, the um, uh, places where you have to make decisions. Because this is not a, um, because you, it's, a, this is not a true square. You're asking it to have orthogonal-like quality to it, but it's not a genuine square. And so you end up putting in extra, because it's fuller here at the front, because that's where this, you, you're sitting. Um, as you go back, it, nar it will narrow. Some of it's, um, here you see, some of it can be quite extreme. Some of it is, you know, pretty normal. This is also curved. So you have um, short rows that you had put in extra, um, pieces right here and an extra piece up here and in order to, and doing that to, to, to follow it you now have to um, work out where you're going to set the ends you make decisions about these some of these you end up putting two in one hole. You, when you, if you come closer, you can see this ortho, um, oblique um, has been put in the same hole as this one. Um, they're called uh, fish eyes um, at when, they, when they have to come together because you, you, um, you don't have a true square. Um, Would a circle be a night view then? Circle's got its own challenge. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a nightmare. It's just a different, different, some different sets of decisions that you make at the, at the, um, at the, at the later stages of the uh, weaving, and that's where your brain has to come in, and that's what's interesting. This is not for people. <laughs> Oh, um, I know of a judge who does this. People who do play chess do this. It's, it's the same kind of, um, it may, you have to make some of the same kinds of uh, thinking decisions. It's not a non-thinking task. Um, although it has, sometimes you can get a really lovely rhythm the way you do with any kind of weaving and you get such satisfaction when it all flows together and you think you're fine and then it breaks. <laughs> or, you know, the natural, natural things happen. Um, so it's, it's the shape of the seat that will really determine um, how difficult it is to uh, work. Here, here's some, a piece of paper that says, avoid out of whack patterns, part one, and there's part two. These are, I'll, I'll send it around, and you can see that when you uh, resolve um, certain places, you've got to make adjustments for the fact that it's out of, going to be out of true. So this isn't, this isn't machine work. It is, it's really a genuine um, craft because you do end up having to use your, the brain. Here's what the cane comes like. This is, uh, and it comes in different gauges, I mean different widths. This is narrow medium, and I think narrow medium is the nicest for working on these mid-19th-century uh, chairs, and um, late-19th-century chairs, any of the Victorian chairs. Um, it's 2.75 milligrams, and it's called narrow medium, but here is an example of all the other sizes. It goes from carriage fine, um, carriage being, uh, they use this, the cane for, um, 
characters, and they started. You know, they really started doing it. They really needed to get their in the Industrial Revolution to create that pre-pressed uh, cane because of uh, trolley cars and the, that all of those um, uh, public uh, conveyances used um, a lot of them used uh, cane. Um, anyway, it goes from carriage fine through to super fine, 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 narrow, um, common, wide binder. When you put your binder around, it's usually one size larger than the, the what you've worked with. Um, so here, just pass it around, take a look at it. Here, is, here are the little hardwood uh, dowels, pegs. Some people use Golf tees. Um, anything. And the the we we end up inventing whatever we can to to you know work it. Um, this is what it comes like, and it, and then you pull it open, and it's got to relax. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, that um, this is a narrow medium, and I had to uh, get it to relax enough in order to get it, um, and then then I curled it up and put it in the water, and then you know. But um, I left one long strand of this outside on my porch and was totally unhappy to find it, that the mildew, the yeah, mold yeah, got yeah. to it. Um, I then, had, you know, then basically had to start bleaching it and try to dry it out and get it to, so it could perform. But um, they, it, it, just a word to the wise, it's an organic material. Um, here are, this is, a, this is a device it's a, for measuring the size. Because when you find the old one, you have to find, figure out what you want to put back into the new. And here's, this is a gauge that will tell you various um, uh, metrics for your... Now, here is um, a set of clippers. That's, that's the thing you, you end up using in your hand all the time. Um, and short, they just cut it fast, and um, you, can do, you can do very fine manual um, work with it. But they're quite sharp. I always put them in corks. Um, Here's the other tool that you end up using um, a fair amount towards. You use, this is an, like an awl, just a pin, sharp, very sharp. And um, I always tell everybody, please, when, as soon as you put it down, put it in your, because um, it's tetanus shot waiting, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, you use this to clean out the holes of the old fabric, to open them up, and you use it to um, lift the parts that are um, that you need to get in and under. You use it to you use it to, any way you can uh, for all sorts of you know things. This is this happens to be one I got at the landfill too, and it has a. Um, I, I don't like the curve, but I like the length. And this has a sort of spatula type ending. And so I can put that um, underneath and lift it more successfully than this, which is uh, too thin in some applications. So this happens to be any kind of um, you know, slot screw, screwdriver um, with a small enough edge you can use. Um, Ah. Okay, I've come to a natural pause. Let's, um, can I entertain some questions before I get going on anything else? The one question I have 
question we get is, making is how long does it take to make basket? So how long does oh, it take to make good. an average chair? Mm -hmm. Well, if we're going to consider this as the average chair, right? This sort of mid 19th century or Victorian product, um, it has, uh, you know, it has numbers. The, the the holes, the number of holes, create the length of some of the length of work time, and um, I will, I want to talk about the economics of that after after we finish. Um, I can do it if I dedicate myself to it in three or four days. S there's seven steps, um, but I don't like to. I mean, my, my brain is not really that uh, um, thrilled about trying to do the same, you know, make the same kinds of decisions. Also, you know, I don't have uninterrupted time. Again, you know, I'm not out to see. Um, none of us are. So it, you get a lot of interruptions, and you cannot, um, you can't keep, you can't keep doing this if you're interrupted, because when you're interrupted, then you've got a whole chain and sequence of actions that you then have to start and stop and start again, and you're, it, it doesn't work so readily um, if you're. Uh, entertaining a lot of um, other things, and people who like the people who like the the course that we did were people who were very busy otherwise, but they came and then they could just stand in front of this thing and they could just do it. And they blotted up their other problems out of their life. So it has, it does have that um, side effect. The, um, so the length of time can take anywhere from three, four days to, um, a month, two months. Um, some of my some of my uh, tough jobs have taken me three months, getting getting back to them and resolving um, problems as I go along with them. The um, now the thing about this is we're caught betwixt and between because the economics of doing this are all, as I say, upside down. Um, you cannot get paid for successfully for the amount of time and labor that you put in it because the chair ultimately is not worth the amount of money that time that you've put into it. Say, say you wanted a, a $15 an hour wage. <laughs> well, you've been putting, um, you put uh, 15 to 20 hours in. Good. And so it goes from anywhere from 150 to 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 300 dollars right there, and you cannot sell this chair for 300 dollars. You can't sell it for a 200 dollars. You can't. You just. It's so. I end up talking to people a lot about the sentiment. How attached are they to the chairs? What does it mean to them? Are they willing to make that investment to, um, to have me spend my time doing it and getting it to where they can use it again? Um, and by the time people come to ask about it, they do want it. They, they, they made some kind of emotional commitment to it. Um, but I would like to uh, teach more people so that m it was being done more and we could maybe start um, by, by redoing it, you've enhanced the value of it. If it had to go out into the marketplace, uh, Rafael Asona had to um, uh, sell it, he would, get up, he would start to get higher prices as these get scarcer, um, and yet they're still u u useful. So there's, there is a way of changing the economics of it, but it's going to take a long time, and we've got to have a skilled workforce to do it. Um, and that's the idea of me trying to teach people to do it. Um, the, at H.H. H. Perkins, they told me that in Connecticut, the typical chair now costs uh, $275 to retain. But I know that I can spend $25 worth of uh, materials and 
not even that, um, say, say $15 worth of materials and um, uh, 15 hours of my time and I'll have um, you know, a chair that is, is uh, worthy. Um, and then I, I tend to, how do I make uh, the decision about what I charge people? Uh, it's, I, I go according to what the, I think the person can handle. It's, it, for me, it, it's, it's not a professional job. I don't have to live on the income. And I don't think anybody has ever successfully uh, lived for any length of time. With one exception I want, that I know of, and that is, um, and that's also the reason why I'm here, is Jose Reyes. Jose Reyes, before he made the friendship baskets, his bread and butter work. He's a man with a Harvard education. I mean, so it's, we're not talking stupid or silly. We're talking about highly, you know, uh, refined uh, person. Um, he fed his fa young family on the, the um, whatever he could do, which was painting and rechaining, recaining chairs. So I'm, you know, I'm delighted that this is Jose's, the whole exhibit is dedicated to Jose's, and this is some of the underpinnings of um, uh, how he stayed attached to the Nantucket community. Um, for all we know, the things, the chairs that we're picking up in the landfill might have been done by him, it might pass through his hands. Um, we just, we don't know, because it's, it's unsigned, it's not artistic, per se, it doesn't have um, this enhanced value, but it does um, create a lovely um, uh, uh, seating in your, your home. And the economics are tough, I think, um, because then you end up doing something that's called a labor of love. And I don't know. I don't know how um, how that's gonna how that's gonna end up working out. But I don't want the skills to be lost. I want to get, have the skills there, um, and people can teach themselves. There's a fair amount of uh, written literature. H. H. Perkins um, always hands out a um, a little booklet that gives you the um, with lovely photographs, and and you you can do it yourself easily, but it's a commitment of time. So it's, right, we're saying 15 hours maybe for a normal chair. Um, the, the good thing that I can see is that in the future is that the, you know, the young millennials don't want any part of this. This is part of the uh, brown furniture phenomenon. <laughs> and it's painful for those of us who um, grew up with it and like it and, and find value in it and want to maintain it. Um, but they, millennials are going to get clipped by this <laughs> because um, the, they're now really um, gung-ho with mid-century modern furniture. Well, that was done a lot by the Danes. Mm -hmm. And the Danes, as seafaring people, use cord for their seats, rope cord. And so all of these mid-century high-end pieces, which are now realizing a hefty price in the marketplace, will have to be redone too. And somebody's got to be able to do it. And so then, so now you have a chair that is um, a more valuable and the person who has the skills can match, um, get a, a better, better fee, basically. Um, I have a Hans Wagner chair, it's called The Chair. Um, I found it on an island in a basement, and I've got to uh, re reassemble it. But I'm going to try to teach. I'm going to teach myself how to do that that mid-century um, fabrication, so that I I can keep those things help keep those alive. Um, I know there's some there's lots of other things I'm missing, but you know the the I was. Um, 
tickled pink when I read in the Paul Witten's um, biography of Jose Reyes that he, once he'd made his lightship friendship baskets, he put aside his caning work, his, the chair work. He didn't want to, he didn't return to it. He was, he'd created a, um, an economic product and an artistic product that um, uh, supported his family and made him, uh, you know, proud of his handwork. Um, is there any other kinds of questions? I'm going to start. I have a small question. Um, we had a chair that had powder post beetles in it, and we shipped it off. We brought it over to Hyannis to that lovely company that dips furniture to get rid of powder post beetles. Did it work? It worked great. And the caning came out beautiful. We thought that, because when we brought it in, the man said to us, I can't guarantee you the caning's going to, what's going to happen? This is, you know, strong oh, you, chemicals. You put the caning in the chemicals. Whole chair went. The okay. Chairs had it. They were. It was a dining room, and one chair. Yeah. We found had powder post beetles in it. So we brought it over, and he said, "I don't know what's going to happen with the cane. I haven't done cane. I haven't. I haven't dipped cane. Mm -hmm. Sign this waiver." And we said, "Well, what happens happened. Came out. It came out beautiful. But it was a little bit different color. <laughs> um, tight as can be still." Because we could compare it with five other chairs that had all been done at the same time. They loosen, they loosen and tighten depending upon how, how much water they've uh, uh, fluid they've. Um, well, this went through a big chemical dipping. Sip. And it's been great, but is there something I should put on that cane? Uh, well, let's on? talk. Yeah, we can talk about maintenance of them because mm -hmm. um, the 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 outside of the cane has this silicon uh natural silicon on it mm -hmm. that's what in, what makes it slide through but you do oh when you're sliding it through you have to make certain there are also there are nodes in this cane and nodes where the um the the bamboo has got um had been um side growth right so you, they've, they've cut, they've shaved the node off very close, but that node is like a little slight bump. And you want to get the cane going in the right direction because otherwise you'll be pulling it and against the grain, and then sometimes you can just slide it. But the silicon on one side leaves on the other side an open and a, a thirst, a, a receptive fluid, uh, Hydrus, it's it it takes water, and it's water that um, is going to help maintain the chair, because the cane because it loves to be hydrated, and um, I will put this moist cloth right on there for um, um, an hour, um, and it will. Uh, loosen up slightly, but then you dry it. You dry it out, not in heart, not in sunlight, and you don't leave the chairs next to um, um, radiator vents and you know hot blowing uh, air. You try to what? Not in sunlight, you say? No, not in sunlight. It's too. It's too fast. Oh, okay. You want you okay. want it. You want it to reabsorb slowly, mm -hmm. so that it can maintain hold it in. Um, slowly. Uh, if you, you, you dry it too fast, it will uh, just give over too fast. So, um, and then some people uh, will put uh, tongue oil on the outside. And um, it used to be shellac, but they tell me, I love shellac. I've always loved shellac. We have baskets of shellac. Yeah, but they say that it dries out the cane faster. It's uh, easy to fix. What? It's an old basket that's been shellac. It's what? It's easier to fix than a basket that's in polyurethane because it's easier to take it apart for shellac and refix it. So it might be easier to fix a chair that was shellac. It, yeah. Um, I put uh, shellac on the, um, I, think th I think that's been shellac. I put a, a little bit of shellac there um, to, to liven up the, the wood and to repair it. Um, but uh, uh, they now use tongue oil, which is, you know, they've used tongue oil for, oh, like gun stocks, any, any really fine uh, work, woodwork. Um, but I'm happy with shellac. And you only shellac the top. You, you never shellac the bottom because you want it, to, that's where the, the cane is breathing. Yeah. 
and um, you need to you need to keep it and try to keep it moist or moister, but not enough to uh, support <laughs> mildew. Mm -hmm. And um, you, uh, it's just it's it's a really forgiving. Um, accepting material, it just and it, and it does. The, the, it's this anomaly of creating this really man-made grid with organic material and um, offbeat patterns of seats. That's really the. The thing of it, it's a, it's a man, it's a, it's a man, it's a, you know, really human um, uh, cultural activity, because it's it's so various. Every chair is different. Most of them. I mean, you get sets of them for uh, uh, dining rooms, but um, all of these are. Uh, different pieces. They all share things in common, but um, they're all they're all different individuals, and that gives that gives me the um, challenge to keep on doing it, to keep on making the um, programs. Now, I would love to have um, uh, set up an arrangement whereby people could learn the skill and pass it along, or use it to. Um, uh, Keep these, keep these guys alive longer, and I'm trying to figure out how to how to about, go about doing it. And, and you're part of my crew of uh, people who are, need to to give me some advice on where uh, where and how to uh, help promote it. Are there other questions? Okay. Yeah. yeah. You sure. Okay, Thank good. Thank you, ma'am. What about the high schools? Or the schools? Yeah, the schools. I don't know if the kids have the patience. <laughs> no, I think, you know, the, the new technology has um, changed the attention, uh, uh, their attention. And I think there always will be some people who are introverted and, and happily, you know, working and focused and, and, can, and are attracted to doing it. But I just don't know enough young people of, to, to tell you that because it seems to me that they're much happier cruising around, talking on their machines. <laughs> they're quite dexterous, though. I mean, I, um, they, they, they've got the small hand skills, right? <laughs> And they've got really good eyes still. Yes, they've got it. <laughs> Your eyesight is still really good. <laughs> yes, and that's another thing. It's the, the eyesight is really, um, I can't do this in the, at night, only during the day. Yeah, natural light helps. Okay, thank you. Thank you.